Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Doon. Today's date is Monday, August 10th, 2015. And here's a look at what's coming up. Tonight, Donald Trump continues to dominate the Republican primary. But what do listeners of the Alex Jones Show think of Trump? Do you think he's smoking his own propaganda? Or do you think he's consciously met with the Clintons? Or do you think he's for real? Then, the EPA dumps toxic waste into a river in Colorado. More than 550 gallons per minute of toxic waste, including arsenic and lead, have seeped into the river, which has now crossed the Colorado state border and into New Mexico. Plus, an emergency is declared once again in Ferguson as St. Louis County prepares for more riots and civil unrest after an 18-year-old was shot and critically wounded by police. InfoWars reporters Jakari Jackson and Joe Biggs hit the road to cover the action. All that plus much more up next in the InfoWars Nightly News. Welcome back. Now we have everything that was there in the Tonight Plus. We're going to play an excerpt from a piece I did about a year ago uh, talking about how the EPA wants to kill your grandmother with all the draconian uh, restrictions they're putting on people using fireplaces. And But that will all be coming up. First story tonight, Donald Trump is still in the news, whether you like it or not and whether you think he's good or not. Here it is out of NBC. Donald Trump still in the lead after debates. New NBC News Survey Monkey poll says so uh, the overnight poll was conducted for 24 hours from friday evening into saturday during that period donald trump stayed in the headlines due to his negative comments about megan kelly and her bloody eyes and was disinvited from a major conservative gathering in atlanta but none of that stopped trump from coming in at, t at the top of the poll with 23 percent senator ted cruz was next on the list with 13 percent and then if you uh, go to the graphic <laughs> over who won the debate they don't even show Rand Paul, which is, you know, that's just one of the things they do, or they're going to keep excluding Rand Paul from this list. So who knows whether Trump is good or bad. Uh, Alex Jones took a bunch of calls today on what people thought of Trump, and we're going to get to that in one second. But first, I want to replay a report we put out on Friday called, Is Trump a Wolf in Sheep's Clothing? Let's go to that report now. America, remember when a young upstart Illinois Senator Barack Obama promised everything under the sun? Obama promised to cut the deficit in half. Well, it was 10 trillion then, it's over 18 trillion now. Obama promised shovel-ready American jobs, but as Obama's golf games increased and he spent millions of taxpayer dollars on his vacations, he ignored his jobs council, eventually disbanding it, and now we have an economy with more than one-third of the country on welfare. Not to mention an emboldened surveillance state, militarized constitution despising police, a middle class destroying health care program, wide open borders, huge foreign policy failures in the Middle East, Europe and South America, an impending corporate world government courtesy of the TPP, and a nation increasingly divided on race. Basically, everything Obama promised was a big fat lie. His biggest achievement appears to be the ability to lead the American people along like lemmings. Nature, in her infinite wisdom, has spared a few. Back on the Arctic plain, there remains the small handful that did not make this fatal journey. So who's the globalist straw man this time around? Could it be Donald Trump? The Washington Post reported that former President Bill Clinton had a private telephone conversation in late spring with Donald Trump at the same time that the billionaire investor and reality television star was nearing a decision to run for the White House, according to associates of both men. Four Trump allies and one Clinton associate familiar with the exchange said that Clinton encouraged Trump's efforts to play a larger role in the Republican Party and offered his own views of the political landscape. Donald Trump is a longtime friend of the Clintons. So what would the strategy look like in order for Trump to buttress Hillary's presidential campaign as she struggles with the shackles of her latest debacle of an FBI email investigation, where at least four of the emails on her private server were found to be classified? First, delay the Democratic presidential debate. Done. We won't see a Democratic presidential debate for over two months and the handful of Democratic candidates are already complaining that the schedule of six primary debates are designed to allow Hillary to shine. Second, send in the Donald to stir up the Republican campaign, 
test the waters by using promises and observations about America that Hillary can utilize later in her campaign. If it weren't for me, you wouldn't even be talking about illegal immigration, Chris. You wouldn't even be talking about it. This was not a subject that was on anybody's mind until I brought it up at my announcement, and I said, Mexico is sending. And once Trump has dominated and weakened the Republican field with his faux populism, Trump can jump right off the Republican bandwagon and run as a third-party candidate, further watering down Republican votes, which is something Trump has already hinted at. Here we are again, debate season when the candidates actually talk about the criminal conspiracy that has devoured our government and transformed it into a corporation masquerading as a democracy. Not to be mentioned again once they are in office, as this brief season of populism and reflection of American values morphs into a reign of tyranny. John Bound for Infowars.com. So I think that's the question people really want answered. Can they trust Donald Trump? Uh, here at InfoWars, we have conflicting uh, reports. Some people are for Donald Trump, and some people are very much against him, think he is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, I'm sort of leaning into the wolf in sheep's clothing camp, definitely, but I do like some of the things he's saying, and I think what he is saying needs to be out on the national stage so those ideas get out there. And so for that, I'm thankful that we do have somebody like Donald Trump. But frankly, I think, you know, the office of the president is a kept office and uh, he has no chance in the end. I think you're going to see a Hillary, Jeb Bush meetup. Um, and I, I think we've been calling that here for a long time. We knew that this is what it was coming down to. They're going to make sure some scandal gets in the way of Donald Trump and stops him at some point. They'll destroy Rand Paul. They're already doing it by pretending he doesn't exist. I mean, Rand Paul's the guy that sits over in the corner and, you know, they just, they shut him out of every graphic. They probably wish they could give him less debate time. They probably give Chris Christie more airtime than they do Rand Paul. And Rand Paul definitely has more of a chance of winning the Republican nomination. So earlier today on the Alex Jones show, he spent most of the time talking about Donald Trump and taking your calls and seeing what people's response out there was to him, the InfoWars audience. And let me tell you, there were some very interesting callers and they, they went the gambit. They went the range of everything from from the college he went to being a Jesuit college to him just being a wolf in sheep's clothing. Here it is in their own words, the callers on The Alex Jones Show. My whole thing is, is that I just don't understand how anybody can support this guy, Trump. Uh, I mean, he's, he's fake. He's obviously fake. He's as real as the caller Smitty that calls up to your show. I mean, he, he stands up there as this beacon of crony capitalism and throws it all in our face and says, Oh, let me tell you something. I took advantage of all these deals. And let me tell you, I'm very proud of this. I'm very proud of this. And it's, it's disgusting. This guy is appealing to the public's goldfish-like attention span by saying all the right things and by being politically incorrect. Meanwhile, Rand Paul has dropped off the face of the earth. He's the one that everybody should be supporting just because he's saying all the right things the exact same way as Obama did in 2008. Is it? really a fun thing to watch of course it is for somebody who has a nihilistic view of things and wants to just be entertained while the whole country burns yeah go ahead and vote for trump but uh you know i wonder what everybody's opinion of him is going to be as far as electability is when he takes jeb bush as his bp because it sure did seem like he really enjoyed standing next to him at the debate james in colorado you're up next go ahead Hey, what's up, Alex? Um, as far as Trump, I don't know if I've coined the term, but uh, a wolf in sheepdog's clothing, I think, is a good one. Because a lot of these people like George Bush to push small government, but then, of course, to print through the Patriot Act, global government. So it's kind of just party politics. And I think Rand Paul should attack him really on two issues, which is eminent domain, the fact that he's kicked so many people off of their private property using the bureaucracy. What's your view on Trump himself? Do you think he's smoking his own propaganda? Or do you think he's consciously met with the Clintons? Or do you think he's for real? Uh, I don't think he's for real. Um, he did give a million dollars to Clinton, supported Rahm Emanuel's uh, Senate campaign. But another thing is his stance on Edward Snowden, where he made the claim that he's a traitor, that, you know, what do we used to do to traitors? We used to either execute them or put them in prison. And the whole thing is that um, 
if you're saying Snowden's a traitor, you're basically saying he's evil, but he has difficulty saying the establishment is evil, so they're incompetent when they're the war criminal. And again, he's a politician, even if he hasn't held office, the same way, you know, uh, it's kind of a drastic example, but, you know, the CIA, they would uh, film generals doing things to kids, blackmail them. I mean, it's still mob politics, regardless. Uh, let's talk to Rich in New York. Rich, you're on the air. Go ahead. Hey, what's up, Alex? Alex, uh, Donald Trump is a game show host. He's clown shoes. The guy panders to anyone who will line his pockets. He's a shill and a half and nothing more. And, you know, just like the way Beck once in a while would say some things are truth because you have to mix lies with the truth in order to get people to even listen to what you say. This is what this guy is. Plain and simple. That's it. Let's go back to your phone calls. Walt in Michigan, you're on the air. Thanks for calling. Hello, Alex. Hey, buddy, go ahead. Uh, go back. You got back from your trip from Rome, huh? Very interesting investigation. We've got some documentaries coming out on it. Yeah, well, Donald Trump went to Fordham Jesuit University, so did Bill Clinton went to Georgetown Jesuit University, and the Jesuit Pope is calling for a new world order just like Clinton did, just like uh, Donald Trump. Trump has paid lots of money to New World Order candidates, and Jeff Bush is a fourth-degree Knight of Columbus bowing to the Pope of Rome in Rome. It's online. You can look up his photographs of him doing that. Rome controls the United States, and the Jesuits control the Vatican from behind the scenes with the Dolfo Nicholas, the Jesuit general, with the present Jesuit Pope. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with Donald Trump. Now, just when you thought it was safe to go back to St. Louis, Ferguson 3.0 has reared its ugly head again. This is the one-year anniversary of the shooting death of Michael Brown. And we have out of the AP, police shooting protests put Ferguson back on edge. Ferguson was a community on edge again Monday, a day after protests marking the anniversary of Michael Brown's death was punctuated with gunshots and police critically wounding a black 18-year-old accused of opening fire on police officers. Now, that 18-year-old happens to be a good friend of Michael Brown. The father of the suspect who was shot called the police version of events a bunch of lies. He said two girls who were with his son told him he was unarmed and had been drawn into a dispute involving two groups of young people. This is the problem. The problem is the way they celebrate commemorating the, the death of their friend is you have two groups of young people having a dispute and pulling out firearms and shooting at each other. That brings in the cops, and then this young man gets shot. Whether he shot at the cops, it remains to be seen. But you don't celebrate a friend of yours of the community getting shot by police by having your own shootout. That just doesn't work. But that's not the way things are going to go in Ferguson. They're already on edge. As tensions escalated, here's how the whole scenario rang out. Several gunshots rang out from the area near a strip of stores, including some that had been looted moments early, earlier. Uh, Belmar believes the shots came from about six different shooters. What prompted a shooting was not clear, but Belmar said two groups had been feuding. Uh, the shot sent protesters and reporters running for cover, and there you go. Then that brings in the police, and more people get shot, and then there, this man is uh, in critical and unstable condition, so he could die. If he does, if he does die, I think that's going to ramp it up into another Ferguson situation, this time Ferguson 3.0. We're going to send our reporters, Joe Biggs and Jakari Jackson, who are Ferguson veterans, on the ground to Ferguson. And here they have more. Jakari Jackson and Joe Biggs reporting for InfoWars.com. As you guys may recall, we've documented quite extensively the activities that have been going on in Ferguson, Missouri. Since last year, we had the incident that happened with Michael Brown. And to get you guys up to speed, uh, Michael Brown was shot after an interaction with an officer. Some people say it was justified. Some people say it's not. Uh, with all the information you can make your own decisions now but since that time we've had multiple actions by the police and also by the people in the crowd that just were uh, pretty sensational to say the least Joe we've had uh, riots tear gas uh, people threatening to burn down the police station attacks on the police station so there's plenty of blame on both sides but that can't include any and everybody you know there are plenty of good protesters out there and there are plenty of good police officers who just want to keep the streets safe but you also have a good mixture more than a few of bad apples in both sides of the bunch so we've been out there in this past august we were out there this past november and now we have a new incident that's going to send us out in just a few hours joe ferguson 3.0 jacari jackson and joe biggs we will be on our way there in the next few hours 
And what we know, last night was the one-year anniversary of Michael Brown being killed by Officer Darren Wilson. Now, like you said, whether you think it's a justified action or not, we're not. We're just here to cover what's going on. And right now, the facts are there are people out protesting, peaceful protests throughout the the day, largely late at night. A lot of people left. There was about a hundred people left in the crowd. They had undercover police officers dressed in civilian attire walking around, and they spotted people with guns. So those guys were kind of keeping an eye on that. Uh, later in the night, it broke off into basically a gun battle for about a minute long. They said that the fire firefight was going on for about a minute straight. Uh, rounds were coming in towards the police officers and they spotted a suspect running away from that area and that was 18 year old Tyrone Harris Jr. who the police confirmed that uh, he was an armed uh, one of the armed suspects firing into the crowds and towards the police officer and we also now know that he is a friend or was a friend of Michael Brown and now we have a new article at Fox News saying that there's a state of emergency issued for the St. Louis, Missouri area so protests have put the ferguson back on edge there's been another shooting so we're going to go out there and document what's going on so you the american public can be informed about what's happening in ferguson i'm joe biggs jakari jackson keep up with all of our reports on the alex jones channel on youtube and we pray that the boys will be safe and come back unharmed you can follow their progress at our ustream channels it is ustream.tv forward slash alex jones live and also, they'll be putting up reports on our YouTube channel, the Alex Jones channel, which you can find on YouTube. It's our one with over a million subscribers. Now, coming up, we're going to look at the what's going on in the rivers of Colorado with that EPA toxic waste spill. And we're also going to talk about some clean water that you can find in the city of Rome. It's an amazing story that we're going to have. Coming up next, it's Rob Dew here hosting the InfoWars Nightly News. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. If you feel so inclined, please consider following me on Twitter. It's at Dews News. You can read it right there. Now, I just got back from a trip with Alex Jones going to Europe. Spent a couple days in the UK. Went to uh, Barcelona, Spain, then which I shot some amazing drone footage there. Then to Valencia, and then ended up for Rome in a week. And it was very, very hot. Thank goodness Rome has some fountains. Here's the article here. And I'll get to more why this is relevant. The Nassoni, Rome's ubiquitous public fountains, your best ally against thirst in the eternal city. In the world today, few things are free, even water, the definitive gift from nature. Many are familiar with Rome's famous fountains, but few seem to realize that the water coming from the fountains is not only free, but clean and drinkable. So when you're in Rome, be sure to take a sip from the waters of the eternal city. There you can see right there, that is the Fountain del uh, Giannicoli, which stands for the, the Fountain on Janaculum Hill, which is a great view overlooking the city just across the Tiber River. So this water comes from a giant aquifer and goes to many fountains. There's about 2,500 fountains. There you can see right there, that's our, our tour guide uh, that me and Alex had. And you're going to see Alex actually take a drink from these. Everywhere. These things are everywhere. And if as long as the water's running out of that spigot, you know, you can wash your hair, or put splash some in your face down in the basin, but then you can actually drink out of the hose in there. And it, it's a it's a cast iron hose. There, Nasoni stands for nose, which you can see that one kind of looks like a nose. That's a fountain actually near uh, the Colosseum where people were drinking. Here's one in a park. It was a really run down park, but you know, the pigeons were getting water and then here comes a, a, a local immigrant and you can see how trashy the park is. You know, Rome is kind of falling into... Uh, into decay and he's even you know washing his hands and getting a drink and it's just amazing there's about 2500 of these all over the city they provide free water for people the water in rome is actually free this last fountain here is the fontana de pantheon which is the fountain right in front of the Pan pantheon as they say it. they say in uh, rome the pantheone so and and which is actually the site of this next report that i shot on uh, and uploaded it over the weekend. And the great thing about the water in Rome is that there's no chlorine in it and there's no fluoride in it. They don't need to do it because it's always moving. It doesn't ever sit in storage tanks. It's never in a spot where it could spoil. So it really is probably some of the cleanest water you could drink in the world. And I proved that by drinking it in this next report. 
Rob Dew here with InfoWars.com. I am standing in front of the Pantheon, or as they say in Rome, Pantheone. I was corrected by the limo, or the taxi driver, I should say. Uh, there's a ton of taxi drivers here, but you gotta get them at the taxi stations, or call them. Really interesting way to get around. You can also get a bus that'll take you around all the monuments for about 18 euros. But uh, that's not why I'm making this video. If you notice behind me, there's a fountain. There's the obelisk up there. A lot of obelisks in Rome. They say there's more obelisks in Rome than in Egypt. But uh, what's interesting about this fountain is where the water is. And look, you can see some people even drinking the water. And when in Rome, excuse me, sir, you just get, put your, so the water comes from out of the mountains. Uh, they Romans used to bring it here in aqueducts, but you can actually drink this water. It's a uh, crystal clear. Doesn't have chlorine. Doesn't have fluoride. And it's really cold and really refreshing. Um, amazing because it's super hot here in Rome, caldo as they say. And so this is one way to beat the heat. They have these fountains all over the place. Uh, I've watched other people drink out of them, and until I went on a, a tour with a, a pretty informative tour guide. Um, I didn't believe that you could drink out of them or that you should, but he goes, no, I do it all the time. And so he was drinking out of them, so I said, all right, fine, I'll do it. Anyway, bottoms up from uh, Rome. This is our last day. Uh, we're going to be back in the United States tomorrow. She had an amazing interview with Leo Zagami. He's a Vatican, in, kind of Vatican secret society uh, researcher, author, a bit of an insider. He knows a lot of people in there, a lot of the Vatican Guard we shot a uh, video right out in front of St. Peter's and actually were turned, uh, the cops showed up pretty quickly after about 15 minutes and uh, kicked us out. Um, and he showed us some other places that are also little uh, sovereign states here inside Rome. It's not just Vatican City. There's some other uh, Jesuit type places that are here. So we'll have all that. Uh, we're going to be putting that together in a uh, video interview. And um, with that, there's a last view of the fountain right there and here's another look at the pantheon and it's caldo so when in rome drink the water rob do for infowars.com so i drank in about 15 fountains in rome in different parts uh, the last one my final cab driver took me to he insisted on taking me to a, a few nice places he saw that i was a photographer and he was unlike any of the other cab drivers but he took me to this one and it was the coldest i i had drank since i was there it was amazingly cold it came out of a giant rock and uh from that rock there were two nessone spigots coming out and uh, man it was great great water i want to thank that cab driver i wish i could remember his name but um anyway moving on from water to to something that's not so good to drink even even if it is uh who knows what's in it but it's coca-cola in fact, the New York Times just came out with an article, Coca-Cola funds scientists who shift blame from obesity away from bad diets. So it's not calories that you need to worry about. You just need to have more exercise. And here's the problem with Coca-Cola and drinks like that. It's not just the dyes. It's not just the, the sugary high fructose corn syrup that's in there. It's everything else that gets in your body. I mean, they've done studies where you could put a rusty nail inside a jar of Coca-Cola and it eats away the rust. People use it as a cleaning solution. This is some strong stuff. Yet, Coca-Cola is now funding some science that it wants to move away from, hey, don't worry about calories, just exercise a lot. In fact, you could drink 10 Cokes a day, and as long as you run a couple miles, you're gonna be fine. Let me tell you, there's a lot of other side effects that go along with drinking a lot of Coca-Cola. And uh, I just wanna read the first part of this article here from the New York Times. Coca-Cola, the world's largest producer of sugary beverages, is backing a new science-based solution to the obesity crisis. To maintain a healthy weight, get more exercise and worry less about cutting calories. So, so they are definitely serious about wanting to push more Coke on people. And uh, with that, we have Lee and McAdoo with more on Coca-Cola and how much they want you to drink. Forget about curbing junk food, just get more exercise. That's the biased message coming out of some Coca-Cola-funded obesity research. The megacorporation is under fire for donating millions of dollars to a nonprofit that's been spreading this message in medical journals and through social media. Most of the focus 
in the popular media and in the scientific press is, oh, they're eating too much, eating too much, eating too much, blaming fast food, uh, blaming sugary drinks, and so on. And there's really virtually no compelling evidence that that, in fact, is a cause. The Global Energy Balance Network says there is strong evidence that the key to preventing weight gain isn't about reducing food intake, but maintaining an active lifestyle and eating more calories. To back up this claim, they provide links to two research papers, each of which contain this footnote. The publication of this article was supported by the Coca-Cola Company. The creators of GEBN say they just wanted to raise awareness about both sides of the energy balance equation. The group disclosed that they'd received an unrestricted education gift from Coca-Cola. So clearly, the Global Energy Balance Network is nothing more than a front group meant to deflect attention away from recent studies about sugary drinks and their link to obesity and type 2 diabetes. This clash comes in a period of rising efforts to tax sugary drinks, remove them from schools, and stop companies from marketing them to children. As people have learned about the effects of sugary drinks, consumption levels have dropped by 25%. But does funding research lead to bias? Well, a recent analysis of beverage studies found that those funded by Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, the American Beverage Association, and the sugar industry were five times more likely to find no link between sugary drinks and weight gain than studies without financial conflicts. You might find this a little bit reminiscent of the tactics used by the tobacco industry. They enlisted experts to become merchants of doubt about the health hazards of smoking. And you've probably heard that aspartame causes cancer, even though it's FDA approved. However, PepsiCo just removed the artificial sweetener from Diet Pepsi, suggesting there's something iffy about it. And let's not forget how one provocateur using valid study results was able to fool some reporters into writing that chocolate aids weight loss. So how can we trust junk food science? Be smart, be skeptical, and the bottom line, the best foods that are out there for our health and for our weight for everything, need no scientific claims. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Now, coming up in the next segment, we're going to play a portion of a video that I made called The EPA Wants to Kill Your Granny, showing other ways that the EPA is destroying the environment and destroying, trying to kill people as well. But first, let's get to this article here. Residents on edge as toxic Colorado spill larger than first reported. Huh, no doubt. Now they're saying it's 3 million gallons of water when at first it was... One million. Uh, CBS Denver reports that Governor Hickenlooper is preparing a state of emergency for areas of southwestern Colorado along the Animas River. Both the towns of Durango and La Plata uh, County have already issued their own emergency orders. The agency has so far been unable to determine whether humans or aquatic life face health risks. However, EPA toxicologist Deborah McKeon said the sludge moved so quickly after the spill, it would not have caused significant health effects to animals that consumed the water. Uh, meanwhile, you have a Farmington resident, Rosemary Hart, who told CBS News, I'm here on my property. I cannot shower. I cannot cook. I cannot do anything with water from my well. And with more on the EPA created 1 million gallon, now 3 million gallon toxic spill that has gone into the Animus River. We invite on the show chemist from Southern California at Chafee College, Jonathan Munn. He is specifically trained in biological testing of compounds and ingredients. Jonathan, welcome to the show. My first question is what is in this toxic sludge? Well, it's hard to say exactly what is in it. The, uh, the contents probably contain heavy metals like copper, lead, arsenic, cadmium, aluminum. Uh, there's, there's a number of other, other uh, what are called anions that could be in there, like sulfates and things like that. Um, all of these chemicals um, we kind of call gram quantities. So what that means is that it doesn't take very much, only a couple grams to... Uh, actually cause um, death or severe damage from the, the chemicals. And, and um, out of those, cadmium and chromium and, I guess, mercury, if it's in there, those are going to be the worst. Is that correct? Yeah, those those are going to be the among the worst. I mean, lead is really bad for especially kids and developing brains. Um, uh, it's it's just absolutely brutal. What it does is it, it uh, mimics other metals as it goes into your, your blood-brain barrier, um, actually calcium, um, and it... Uh, prevents uh, enzymatic processes uh, from happening in multiple organs throughout your body. But uh, cadmium is, is definitely among the worst. And 
and uh, the small amounts of it can cause irreversible liver and, and kidney damage. Um, so the, the implications of this, it, it's just going to keep going. So although it you know may get flushed out with clean water um, over the next few months, what you will see is a, a residual amount that's left in the, the mud and debris uh, along the banks of the river. And especially for kids and somebody who might be uh, shuffling through that mud, um, these, these chemicals and compounds are going to be found in that. And um, at any other later time in flooding or in areas that are developed, if these uh, compounds are brought up into dust, into the air, that's uh, uh, even more of a, a risk factor, um, and especially in combination. So what we talk about in, in chemistry, a lot is that there are added additive effects and um, uh, multiplying effects. And so that means that, that, that something that is not particularly dangerous by itself in conjunction with something else can be absolutely lethal. Um, so uh, especially for, for small kids or, or going up the food chain, this is, a, this is really quite huge. Well, and the EPA on the 9th uh, put out a statement. They don't, they don't believe wildlife will suffer any significant health impacts from the large volume of wastewater that spilled into the river. So the EPA is kind of saying no big deal, even though they caused this. And uh, I, I just think it, it, it's atrocious that this is the, the organization that has been determined to you know, safeguard our environment, yet we see them time and time again creating uh, creating environmental hazards that aren't necessarily right. environmental hazards, and then you know, causing stuff like this, which is a real environmental hazard. We also caught the EPA testing uh, diesel fumes on people, having them breathe diesel fumes to test the right. particulate, and they weren't even telling these people what they were doing. It was just, oh, by the way, uh, surprise, you're breathing diesel fumes. So I yeah. don't think we can trust a word out of these guys. And you know, so you're, so you're thinking it'll take like a month or so for this to get flushed through the initial uh, waterway system. Well, yeah, but you gotta you gotta think that there are areas of the river that bend and and that go into marsh areas. So uh, the the fallout of this is just going to keep going for years. Uh, I mean, uh, in mathematics, you can divide a number you you can divide a number by two as many times as you want. You'll never get to zero. So uh, the concentration of these chemicals will probably always be present in the area. So. Um, although it may be small and it may be negligible uh, for us, um, with something like cadmium, I mean, we're talking about micrograms per per liter um, could potentially cause damage to the kin the kidneys. Yeah. So, um, and and as a chemist, I mean, we do have a, a number of, of toxic chemicals here that that we're very safe about, and and these are the kind of things that we call a rattlesnake out of a cage. Now, Jonathan, in, in addition to the immediate effects, what about this stuff getting into people's wells uh, or even people using it to irrigate their crops? This is near Farmington, New Mexico. So the potential of other you know, crops picking up these minerals into the food, what is that going to do? Yeah, so actually I was, I was looking into that, and, and what it looks like is there's actually a, a number of cases in Japan where ca uh, cadmium specifically uh, has gotten into rice crops and and poisoned uh, the, the, um, those that eat the rice. Um, and what it does is it accumulates. So it may not affect the first generation, but it, it sits in the soil and the more of it that goes in, it, the water evaporates out and the, the concentration of the, the minerals and um, toxins um, actually accumulate. Well, Jonathan, thank you for joining us. Uh, appreciate any updates that you have on this in the future. Thanks for con reaching out and contacting us today. Um, Absolutely. It's, it's the way, uh, you know, this is the way InfoWars works. I was going through my email, and, and here we have a, a chemist over in Southern California sending me all this information. I said, why don't you come on and talk about it? Well, uh, I saw it this morning. I just can't believe it, especially that they're, they're really not making a big deal. And, and so, like I said in my initial email, I mean, this, this seems like the kind of thing. They're, they're broadcasting over here wind reports and dust storms, you know, but uh, a spill in the river that you might be playing in or swimming in uh, no seems deal. like something you'd want to, yeah. Well, broadcast. and this stuff comes from China, too. We have all kind of dust particulates that come over from China through the jet stream, and that's causing oh, yeah. health problems here. So if you think this can't cause health problems anywhere else in the country, it's just going to be localized, you're wrong. I mean, all, well, as you all see, this stuff has to do. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, as you see, it's going right from Colorado into New Mexico. So. There you go. Yeah. Well, once again, thanks for joining us, and uh, we hope to talk to you soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, the EPA would have you believe this was some accident, and they didn't know it was going to happen, but 
I got sent another interesting email today from a, a Morgan Edwards who sent a letter to the editor from one Dave Taylor from Farmington, and it reads, EPA plan is really super fund blitzkrieg. Based on my 47 years experience as a professional geologist, it appears to me that the EPA is setting up your town and the area for a possible super fund blitzkrieg. Basically, what he's saying is they're going to put so much water into the mine and slowly fill it up, and it's going to go into other areas, and then eventually it's going to find its way out into the river. So their first plan of saying, hey, we're going to clean up this area using this plan A, once it fails, then they're going to go, oh, plan B. So, uh, gee, plan A didn't work. So I guess we'll have to build a treatment plant and cost taxpayers $100 million to $500 million. That's another way, you know, the EPA can keep its significance going by creating these disasters that then they have to clean up. This was something that was being left alone. And it, it was in, contained in that area. But now they've released it onto the world. So then they could go, hey, we're going to be your saviors. We got to have a hundred million dollar uh, treatment plant. That anyway, that's from Dave Taylor of Farmington. Interesting to see how he kind of predicted this just two weeks ago. So coming up, we're going to play part of a report that I did about the EPA wanting to kill your granny and just show you the other ways the EPA is trying to destroy your life. That's coming up next on the Infowars Nightly News. This is Rob Dew for Infowars.com and Infowars Nightly News. Today's report focuses on the EPA and specifically how the EPA wants to control aspects of your life. More specific than that, how they want to get rid of fires. That's right, the tool that we've been using for over 10,000 years to keep us warm, to cook our food, to heat our homes, they want to get rid of it. Even more specific than that, how they want to kill your grandmother. That's right. But before we get into those articles, I want to get into some climate change news. That's right, some global warming's happening all over the United States right now, especially if you go outside, you can feel it everywhere. Winter blast delays schools, closes ski resorts, moves east. Coldest blast of Arctic air so far this winter is moving east across the country, delaying school openings, triggering frostbite concerns, and even forcing a Minnesota ski resort to close early over the weekend. Across most of the country, they're expecting temperatures to be 10 to 35 degrees below normal, with wind chills of minus 25 and even up to minus 45 degrees in northern Ohio. 2014 Chicago has been the coldest in years. That's out of CBS Local. The last time the average annual year-to-date temperature was this cold was back in 1904. NOAA, winter 2013-14, among the coldest on record in Midwest. And these record cold temperatures aren't just limited to the United States. In the UK, winter 2014 set to be the coldest for century. Britain faces Arctic freeze in just weeks. And what do all these global warming record cold temperatures mean? Well, it means a lot of people are going to die. It's not the cold, not global warming that we should be worried about. No one seems to be upset that in modern Britain, old people are freezing to death as hidden taxes make fuel more expensive. The government's chief scientific officer, Sir David King, later declared that climate change was more serious than the threat of terrorism in terms of the number of lives that can be lost. Since Sir David's exonerations, some 250,000 Brits have died from the cold and 10,000 from the heat. So there you have it. Since 2003, Hundreds of thousands of people, mostly elderly, have died in Britain due to the cold than from the heat. We are the independent. Bitter conditions linked to deaths of additional 31,000 people last winter, a rise of almost one third. Pensioners were worse affected by the 31,000 additional deaths, which were calculated by comparing the death rates among non-winter months to those that occur between December and March, the ONS report states. Elderly person dies every seven minutes due to fuel poverty scandal. And this UK Express article talks about how nearly 3.5 million people will not be able to pay their heating bill this winter. Back to the US. Killer cold, winter is deadlier than summer in US. Winter cold kills twice as many Americans as does summer heat. About 2,000 US residents die each year from weather-related causes of death. One interesting finding was the high number of deaths in rural West due to the cold. New York Times, even before long winter begins, energy bills send shivers in England. And talks about a guy named John York who in October paid about $375 for his heating bill. In November, his bill jumped to $788, a staggering increase of 110%. OzarkFirst.com reports heating bills on the rise for many as temperatures drop. So what do those articles show? One, that the northern hemisphere is getting cooler, not warmer, as many have predicted, especially all those climate change Nazis out there. And two, this is really affects old people. So now I'm going to show you how the EPA is trying to kill your grandmother. What do most people use in the West and in the North? They use wood-burning stoves. Wood's a great source of heat. 
It's abundant. It's everywhere. People can get it themselves and they don't have to rely on an infrastructure to deliver it to them. Plus, they don't get those utility bills related that other people get. They're not getting the gas. They're not getting the electrical increases. They're just burning wood that can be found anywhere. Well, that is, of course, unless you live in Oregon. Air regulators ban visible chimney smoke from wood stoves in Eugene area. Wood stove owners in the Eugene Springfield area have been pouring on the fuel during the cold snap. And air quality regulators say a buildup in pollution means that the burning has to be curbed. The Eugene Register Guard reports that such bans may become more frequent because federal standards on particulate pollution have been tightened. Agency bans wood burning stove in three cities. Tighter particulate pollution standards set by the federal government in 2006 have required communities nationwide to clamp down on wood stove burning and other sources of smoke carrying small particulate matter. And this brochure is put out by El Rapa, the Lane County Regional Air Protection Agency. It says, burning wood can be an economical way to heat your home. However, burning wood improperly wastes fuel and causes harmful air pollution. And it shows some pictures of what is proper smoke and what is not proper smoke. And it talks about the, the terror threat levels they have for smoke pollution, green, yellow, red one, and red two, and what they mean to you. And they can actually fine you between $50 and $500 for each infraction of visible smoke coming out of your chimney when they put out these burn bans. Citations issued for violating wood stove ban. Eugene, Oregon. For the first time in five years, the Lane Regional Air Protection Agency will issue citations to some Eugene residents for violating a burn ban. El Rapa receives call from neighbors during the burn ban who said they saw those living around them in violation of the burn ban. The agency then goes out and inspects the report for themselves. So they've got their tattletale squad set up. They have a hotline you can call. And then they send out an agent to actually look at the smoke coming from your chimney to see if it violates, according to this chart, one of their burn ban violation rules. And this doesn't just happen in Oregon. It's happening all over the country, and it's due to the EPA. Here's some more areas where it's happening. Fireplace use banned in several California counties. Air district officials have issued a ban on fireplaces in seven California counties. No smoking. New York City bans fireplace construction. On July 1st, no wood-burning fireplaces can be built in New York City residences. And a measure announced by Mayor Bill de Blasio on Earth Day. And this burn ban would even cover the mayor's residence where the original Yule Tide log was filmed, although we know government officials never have to abide by the rules that they set upon the rest of us. Now let's go to Washington State. Wood stove and fireplace restrictions announced due to air quality concerns. Indoor burn ban effective immediately. Strict standards were implemented in 1988 by the United States EPA and were further enforced by the state of Washington in 1995. So we're seeing a record here of Western states, very liberal-minded states are taking these environmental regulations set up by the EPA and then creating bodies and boards and agencies and inspectors to go out there and look at people's chimneys, look and see what they're burning and impose fines on them. But why are they going after wood? What is the big deal? Well, I'm about to tell you, here it is. From Forbes, EPA's wood burning stove ban has chilling consequences for many rural people. It seems that wood isn't green or renewable enough anymore. The EPA has recently banned the production and sale of 80% of America's current wood-burning stoves, the oldest heating method known to mankind and a mainstay for rural homes in many of our nation's poorest residents. That's right. It's going after the rural, poor, and old people because a lot of people that are older live in the rural communities. According to the U.S. Census Bureau's 2011 survey, 2.4 million household units burn wood as their primary heating source. That's right, these left people really want to go after stuff that they claim isn't green. Even the burning trees, it's a renewable resource, that's not a green form of technology that they want. They want this really expensive technology. They want people to go out and buy new wood stoves, upgrade their stoves, get rid of the old ones, make them inoperable. And all this is a way to control what humans use and how they use it because they just can't stand free individuals. So that's what they have to do. They have to attack them. EPA bans most wood burning stoves in a corrupt scheme. Fireplaces next. They haven't gone after outdoor appliances or home heating appliances, but they can't be far behind. Will people be able to heat their homes in the future controlled by extreme environmentalists? The ruling will require efficiency and carbon monoxide testing and reporting, which will provide consumers additional information to help them select the best wood heater for their homes which will cost sellers and homeowners time and money as they face an unbending bureaucracy overseeing these simple devices. Yeah, 
Heating your home used to be as simple as starting a fire with some paper and some kindling and some wood. Now you have to bend over backwards to these regulations. You have to look at the soot and smoke that's coming out of your smokestack. And if you don't, your neighbor might turn you in and then you're going to get fined by these agencies out there. It's just another form of hidden tax and it's meant to drive people off their land. And I'll get into that. But let's look at the EPA and what they do. Let's look at some of their activities and see if those are sustainable or proper or even civil. EPA tested deadly pollutants on humans to push Obama administration's agenda. And you can watch the rest of that on the YouTube video titled, The EPA Wants to Kill Your Grandma.